What's up, YouTube family? Listen, Pastor Darius here, man. Just finished a message called Thinking of a Master Plan. It's a message on wisdom. Whatever you're building, you gotta use more than willpower. You gotta use wisdom. This message is gonna help you do just that. It's time to build the wise way. We spent a, a couple of weeks exploring different individuals from the Bible and how they built what they built so that we can learn from them and apply that to our own lives. Uh, we learned from Noah week one, we learned from Nehemiah week two. We're gonna learn from Moses on next week when we close this series out. But on today, we're learning from Jesus. And so I wanna read a few verses of scripture found in the gospel of Matthew chapter number seven, beginning at verse number 24. Matthew seven, verse number 24. These are Jesus' words. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand the rain came down the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash I want to stop the reading of God's word right there and I want to uh, tag a title of this text. I want to talk from this subject in our time together, thinking of a master plan. Everybody under 40 was quiet, 40 and over made some noise there. <laughs> thinking of a master plan. If you push me in a corner and ask me from my pastoral perspective, to use one word that would describe the attitudinal disposition of the, and the mental, physical, and emotional state of Christians that I encounter in various contexts, the word I would use without apprehension is exhausted. Tired. And when I use this word, I don't use it randomly. I use it strategically. I use it intentionally because when I use the word tired, I'm not referring to simple fatigue that's a consequence of activity. When I say tired, I'm speaking of a tiredness that has theological roots. A tiredness that God told Adam in the Garden of Eden would be the consequence of living in a broken world. You remember, after Adam and Eve's insubordination in the Garden of Eden, the scriptures record that God predicts what the future will be like for them. And he says in Genesis 3.19, by the sweat of your brow. You will eat, listen to this, your food until you return to the ground since from, since from it you were taken and for dust you are and dust you will return. God prophetically proclaimed to Adam in this passage that the consequence of his disobedience would be a life of toil where what would have come easy now comes hard. He speaks specifically to Adam about eating, but the statement has larger implications for our appetites. In other words, to get our physical and emotional appetites satisfied is going to take toil and toil makes people tired and all over sacred spaces all over the world people are tired they're praising but they're tired they're worshiping but they're tired they're serving but they're tired they're singing but they're tired and they are not just tired physically they are tired emotionally their soul is tired they are tired from toiling and they are tired of toiling yes. 
and, and, and a group of a group of therapists actually came together recently to form a focus group to attempt to come up with one word that would describe the emotional state of many people in our current American context and the word they came up with was similar to what I'm talking about here from the scriptures the word they came up with was languishing was that a failure to thrive and this is what's interesting. It seems to be inconsistent with the intention of our Heavenly Father. My Bible tells me Jesus says these words. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have a life. Watch this. He didn't say I've come that you might have church. He said I've come that you might have a life. That the purpose of church is to help usher you into the kind of life that you've been called and that you've been created and that you've been commissioned to live. Tired. Toiling. Toiling to raise the kids, toiling to manage the marriage, toiling to create resources, toiling to keep your head above water, toiling to keep yourself in a steady and stable emotional state, toiling to find fulfillment, toiling to be faithful, toiling. And I would argue, family, watch this, that the toiling that we see and the toiling that 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 many of us are experiencing is a result of some teaching. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say some of the toiling we've experienced is a result of some teaching because all teaching doesn't take place in church. And all teaching that, uh, am I making sense here? Yeah. And let me, and let me frame it this way. Uh, when I say our toiling is connected to some teaching, I'm simply suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, that we are all impacted and affected by, by what transpires in culture. Church isn't the only place that's discipling us. Culture often disciples us, and a cultural and social norm is a culture of grinding. We celebrate grinding. We congratulate grinding. We treat sleep deprivation with a badge of honor. Somehow we see lack of self-care as an indication of spiritual stamina and emotional fortitude. We see self-destructive behavior as the only reasonable route to success. Grinding. When Jesus seems to be suggesting here in Matthew 7, there's another way. Jesus offers us something that I think is extremely important and often overlooked. He offers us an alternative path to productivity. He's not saying you have to compromise your productivity. You have been created and wired by your creator to be productive. One of the first commands he gave the human species was to be fruitful and multiply. There's some stuff in you that's got to come out. He gave you gifts and talents that have to be used. I said this last week that some of the dreams that you have in your heart aren't your dreams, they're God's dreams. And if they're your dreams, they're optional activity. But if they're God's dreams, they're divine responsibility. You got to do it. So I'm not arguing against fruitfulness, but Jesus seems to be pointing to a different pathway to productivity. He's saying you can get the same result a different way. 
He's saying you don't have to build that way. Because in a culture of, in, watch this, in our current culture, it's a culture of grinding. But in the culture of the kingdom, it's a culture of grace. The unforced rhythms of grace. No straining, just stepping. Come on. Yeah, in, 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 in our current culture, it's use willpower. But in the kingdom, we use wisdom. And as we consider building what God has called and created and commissioned us to build, I am telling you that you can build the empire without destroying your castle. I'm telling you, you can be successful without self-destructing. I'm telling you, you can have all that God's called you to have and still sleep. Did you hear what I just said? There are times where people ask me, what time you get up? What time you get up? I say, when I wake up. Because I got a revelation that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 7. When you're using willpower, you're using your own strength. But when you tap into wisdom, you're using heaven's resources. Am I making sense here? Yep. We need to build with more than will. We need to build with wisdom. The Bible teaches that our success is not just in working harder. The Bible teaches our success is in working higher. And I am telling you, for some of you, it's your season to go higher. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that John hears a whisper from the Spirit of God saying, come up higher. And just like God did it for John, I believe he's doing it for you and me. He's saying, come on up higher. You've been doing it that way that long. And how's that working for you? It's not working for you. Come on up higher. You let them destroy themselves. You let them engage in self-destructive behavior. If you come up higher, I'm going to give you a different vantage point. You're going to see things differently. And you're going to make strategic moves as opposed to random moves. And I don't know who this is for, but I want to know, am I talking to anybody today? Is this resonating with you? It... Come up, come up higher. He said, come up higher. I want to show you there's another way. Come up, come up higher. I want to show you that there's another way. Uh, uh, this is what the wise man Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. This is an example of what I mean when I say working higher. Ecclesiastes 10, verse number 10. Listen to what Solomon says. Watch this. He says, if the axe is dull and the edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. Did you hear what I just said? Solomon says, if the axe is dull and the edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, more effort, more exertion. He says, but the converse is true. If I take the time to sharpen the edge, I can get more done with less. That's not laziness. That's wisdom. Come on now. Laziness is an unwillingness to work. Wisdom says, I want to find the right way to work. This is your season. I said, this is your season. I said, this is your season to work the right way. You've been working hard. Now it's time to work higher. It's time to build with wisdom. The more wisdom we have, the less effort we need. (laughs) 
This is why the Bible puts a premium on the pursuit of wisdom. This is why the Bible prioritizes wisdom above all else. The Bible puts wisdom in a place of preeminence. The wealthiest man in human history could have asked God for anything. Solomon, but in 1 Kings chapter number 3, God comes to him and asks, what do you want me to do for you? And Solomon says, now Lord my God, you've made your servant king in the place of my father David, but I'm only a little child and don't know how to carry out my duties your servant here is among the people you've chosen a great people too numerous to count a number so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern such a great people of yours and after he prays this prayer y'all don't want to hear this in verse 10 Do you, uh, you don't want to hear it on this side y'all hear verse 10 it says the Lord was pleased The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. And after Solomon successfully built one of the most influential kingdoms in history, he sits back at his old age, puts pen to paper, and in the book of Proverbs, says in Proverbs 4 verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. I'm going to say it again. He says the beginning of what? Where do I start? The beginning of wisdom is this. Get it. <laughs> Though it cost all you have. Get understanding. Watch this. He puts wisdom. He personifies wisdom as a person. And he uses the female gender. He says, cherish her. Cherish wisdom. Watch this. Because if you cherish her, she will exalt. That'll preach, but that's, that's a different. I think y'all got it on the front row. Huh? That's a cherish her and she will exalt you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Wisdom. And I came to talk to some people who are honest enough to say my toil is not working. I came to talk to some people who got a revelation that frustration is your friend. That God uses frustration. He will not remove frustration completely from your life because frustration is an indication you need to make adjustments. That without frustration, you wouldn't have the motivation you need to make the adjustments you need to make. And so there's some frustration that comes in the form of divine agitation. God orchestrates the agitation and as much as you try to release yourself from it get free of it God's like nope I'm not going to allow you to be released from this divine agitation because I want you to use this frustration as fuel to press oh my to press the gas this is your season to use frustration as fuel to press the gas so that you can go to the places he has called and commissioned for you to go. Uh, don't touch anybody, but just air high five them and tell them all gas, no brakes. Tell them that. Yeah, all gas, no brakes. As frustrated as I am, I refuse to stay like I am. As frustrated as I am, I refuse to settle for less than God's best. As frustrated as I am, I'm going to use this frustration as motivation to experience some elevation. I'm not going to be this frustrated and not benefit from it. Nope, my God is a God of retribution and recompense. The devil got to pay me.
I'm not doing all this crying for nothing. I'm not going through all of this for nothing. The Bible tells me if I sow in tears, I'll reap in joy. I came for people today who like, Pastor Darius, I'm with you. I want to build what God's called me to build. But something's telling me there's another way. I, I see the way it's being done. But something's telling me that there's another way. And, and if you're there, Jesus offers some insight. Y'all all right? I got nine minutes, so don't hold your amens. Give me, I need them all in, before these nine minutes over. Uh, here it is, family. Here it is. What Jesus does, I love this. Gosh, I wish I had time. Uh, you got time today, cuz. Some of you are like, this is why I came to the 1130. So I need all this word, PD. You had me driving all the way up here to Duluth. love this because what Jesus is doing here in Matthew 7 we, we read the latter part we, we, we pick up in the middle of a conversation that's being had with a certain type of conversational pattern he's, 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 he's telling three different stories using twos in the earlier portion of Matthew 7 he talks about two roads a narrow one and a wide one. Got me? Okay. Then after he talks about two roads, he talks about two trees. One that bears good fruit and one that bears bad fruit. Then in the latter part of chapter 7, he talks about two houses. And this is what's interesting. The houses can represent anything you build in. You're building a family, you're building a business, you're, right? it can, you're building your life. The houses can represent anything you're building. He says there are two houses. Are y'all ready for this? And they both look the same. On the outside, aesthetically, you can't tell the difference. They both nice on the outside. They look the same on the outside. Their difference isn't discerned until a dilemma. They look the same, Jesus said, but these same houses go through the same storm. And after the storm, one house falls apart. The other house withstands. So it was the storm that revealed the difference. I must say that one more time. It was the storm that revealed the difference. We may look the same on the outside, but it's the storm that reveals the difference. Because some houses' lives have gone through some of the same storms that you've gone through, and those houses fell apart. Those houses crumbled. You've been through the same storm, and you are still, maybe you lost some paint. Maybe you lost some shingles. But you've been through the same storm, and you are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, you didn't even know what was in you. The storm didn't just show others what was in you. The storm showed you what was in you. Is there anybody here that's honest enough to admit you surprised yourself? 
other people were looking at you and saying, how you doing that? And you like, I don't know. But there's something on the inside working on the outside. Oh, what a change. Two houses, they both look the same. Until after the storm. Now watch this. This is interesting. Now I know which house I assume I know which house you want to be. Right? Right? Because we're not working this hard to build something that's going to fall apart when the wind blows. Here's something though. Are y'all ready for this? The diff- Jesus tells us the difference in the houses though and the difference was an effort the difference was not in the effort Jesus did not say one person worked harder on their house than another that, that's, that's, not, that's not what Jesus said the difference isn't in how, how hard they work to build. Jesus said the difference is on what they built on. And I don't know if you've ever seen sand in rocks, but it takes about the same amount of effort. to drag sand as it does to drag rocks. Did you hear what I just said? Yep, Jesus said one house survived not because of how hard the builder worked but how wise the builder was because this builder understood the importance a foundation. One says, I'm going to build on a foundation of sand. The other builds on a foundation of rock. Now, watch this. Metaphorically speaking, both houses are houses of religious people. Because I know what we probably think is the house that made it. That's a kingdom house. And the house that didn't, that's a cultural house. But metaphorically speaking, that's not the text. Because the text says right here, Matthew chapter 7, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, it's like a foolish man. Wait a minute. They both heard the words. Did you hear what I just said? I said they both heard the word. They both heard the words. But Jesus says one hears the words and puts them into practice. This is interesting. <laughs> James puts it this way. James 1.22. Guys, please. Please listen to what I'm about to tell you. James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word. No, 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 no. That's not it. And so deceive yourself. Do you see that? He said listening can be deceptive. Because you can confuse the feeling you have from listening with a result. Did you hear what I just said? 
He said, he said, don't just listen to the word and so deceive yourself. He says, because you start listening to that thing and it starts speaking to you and touching places in your heart and you, right, opening your eyes and you, and it says, you can assume that something has happened that hasn't happened yet. So Jesus said, the person who has learned the skill of applying what they know is the person who is metaphorically building their house on the right foundation. Some of our issue is not ignorance. It's execution. You know enough to be winning. I'm going to say that one more time. You know enough to be winning. You may not know all you want to know. You may not know all you like to know. But you know enough to be winning. And it takes wisdom. It's the skill of biblical application. It is saying now how am I going to take these notes. That I just took. And build on it. We, we kind of we just getting to know each other. I feel like around about January, I, I can really just, I can really just talk, talk. <laughs> I'm still talking now. I'm still, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm, it's double Dutch. I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm still, feel, but, okay, let me just throw this out. Okay, I'll just throw this out. Throw this out. Uh, it's a skill. So watch this. All right. So the Apostle Paul is talking to believers in Corinth about relationships. Now he's talking about relationships. There, he's talking contextually is platonic, not romantic. But if it applies to the platonic, it definitely applies to the romantic. And so he uses an Old Testament metaphor to help them understand who to avoid relationally. So here's the metaphor he uses. He used the metaphor of being unequally yoked. <laughs> so in the Old Testament, two animals would be yoked up to this device, to this device. And so if you had an ox on one side of the yoke, and a donkey on the other side, that's what's called unequally yoked. Because the disposition and the temperaments of the ox and the donkey are different. The ox is more compliant and obedient. You tell the ox to come, it's coming. The donkey on the other hand, <laughs> is much less compliant so Paul's like, don't be unequally yoked because you're going to be an ox yoked up with a donkey. So when the master tell you to come, you're going to want to, but you're going to be limited because you yoked up to someone who don't submit. God's like, give. You, you're trying to give. But the donkey don't want to give. God's like, serve. And you're trying to serve, but the donkey don't want to serve. God's like, move. And you're trying to move, but the donkey doesn't want to move. So Paul's like, loneliness is better than chaos. But you know what that is? That's knowledge. Wisdom is when I see that. When, when I see relationally donkey-like tendencies. Because it's easy to amen what I just said. 
Yep, that's, that's the easiest thing in the world to amen what I just said. But when you find yourself, and it's worse, it's more difficult when an emotional attachment has been formed before discernment has been reached. So now it's like, I like you before I found out who you are. So it takes wisdom now to say it's going to hurt one way or the other. One pain is temporary. One's temporary. The other can be continuous. It's the application. Puts them in the practice. Who hears the words. Cast down. So can I, we all right? All right. Uh, <laughs> Paul also tells believers in Corinth, he gives them some spiritual strategies for mind maintenance. You got you to gotta give, you got to, you got to deliver maintenance on everything. Your relationships need maintenance, your mind needs maintenance. So he tells them, he says, all right, this is what you need to do. You got to cast down. He's literally talking about what we would call spiritual warfare, but he refers, he refers to the mind as the battleground. And this is what he says. He says, all right, one of the things that you have to do, God, he says, the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And he says this, the casting down of imaginations. You know what worry is? Imagination. Did you hear what I just said? One thing happened and we start imagining. Right? I just saw, I think it was uh, the parent company for Facebook, Meta, I think they just laid off like 11,000 people. So we'll see that, say, oh my God, I'm next. And if I'm next, what are we gonna do? We're gonna lose our place. If we lose our place, I gotta move in my mother-in-law. <laughs> Imagination. So what Paul says is this, he gives a strategy. He says, bring every thought into obedience to Christ. So Paul literally says, fight thoughts. Bring it into obedience. You cannot, Martin, the theologian Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, the theologian Martin Luther says, you can't control whether or not a bird lands on your head. You can't control whether or not you're allowed to build a nest. So it's like, okay. And so he expounds, and Paul expounds on this more when he writes to believers in Philippi. He says, whatever's good, whatever's lovely, there be anything, anything virtuous, anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Right? And it says, if you learn how to do that, then the peace of God that passes all understanding will rule your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's easy to amen that. But wisdom, the skill of biblical application is okay, now how do I actually bring my thoughts in obedience to Christ? And Jesus says, whether it's my mental life, whether it's my relational life, whether it's my, found, uh, my financial life, whether it's my professional life, if I'm building that area of my life on the foundation, on the right foundation, on the foundation of wisdom, I'll run into the same storms. That wisdom doesn't exempt you from storms. It just makes you storm-proof. I'm done. Jesus said both houses go through the same storm. One survives it. The other does not. Not because of effort, but because of wisdom. is not always about working harder. 
It's about working higher. Now, how many want in this next season of your life to live with this kind of wisdom? I'm done. Well, we're going to do something today, and I'm going to end the message like this. We're going to do something. It's what Solomon did. It's what the Bible tells us to do. Because when I say wisdom, when I'm talking about common sense, I'm not talking about street smarts. And the Bible says there are two types of wisdom. There's a wisdom from above. It's an uncommon sense. It's, it's, it's when God himself the ultimate expression and the epitome of intelligence said I'm going to give you uncommon sense I'm going to give you a know how that, that you won't even know how you got it so I'm going to give you wisdom with your kids so I'm going to give you wisdom with your spouse I'm going to give you wisdom with your career. I'm giving you wisdom. Or I feel this. I wanna, it's going to give you wisdom with your career so you can have a life-giving one. Life-giving. You cannot make me believe God wants me to get up every day and go to something I hate. He says, I've come that you might have life. And there are aspects of all of our responsibilities that may be frustrating or that we don't prefer, but th that is completely different from something absolutely sucking the life out of you. You don't get there though by, by just by working harder. You have to work higher. Wisdom. This is something I pray for every morning. And I want to pray for us. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, I want you to see this. You should do what? Say, so ask God. I can give you knowledge. He gives you wisdom. Watch this. God who gives generously to some, to most, to a few to all without finding fault. Would you give me the privilege of praying over you what I pray over myself every morning? Lord, give me wisdom. When I open this Bible to preach to you, that's not Princeton. That's not Princeton. When I open this Bible to preach, I'm saying, God, Give me wisdom. Help me see stuff that nobody could teach me to see. I pray this over me every morning. I'm praying it over you. Father, I pray right now for an impartation of the gift of wisdom for every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you that you are giving us uncommon sense. You did it for Solomon. Now would you do it for us? I thank you for this. I thank you that we are stepping into the wisest days of our life. I thank you that we're stepping into sweatless victories. I thank you after seasons of toil, we're about to step into seasons of ease. Where the reaper is going to overtake the sower. I thank you that you're turning our garments of praise in a, a, a spirit of heaviness into the garment of praise. I thank you that you're turning our mourning into dancing. We are stepping into the wisest season of our life. Wisdom is your portion. 
as a parent, as a person, as a spouse. I pray this over you in Jesus' name. Amen. You receive that? Clap your hands, 1130. Woo! I feel his presence. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right. If this message bless you, do me a favor. Share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.